Are massive wildfires an inevitable part of our future landscape? Brendan Carner joins us to talk about two new books, Firestorms and Megafire. How did one giant earthquake in North America change our understanding of the planet? Henry Fountain will tell us about his new book, The Great Quake. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Brendan Kerner joins us now. He is the author, most recently, of a fantastic book, The Skies Belong to Us, Love and Terror in the Golden Age of Hijacking. That came out in... Uh, 2013. 2013. Yeah. Has it been that long? It has. Oh, my God. It's such a great book. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about that excellent book, but to talk about two reviews in this week's issue. Two books, Mega Fire, The Race to Extinguish a Deadly Epidemic of Flame by Michael Kodas. And Firestorm, How Wildfire Will Shape Our Future by Edward Struzik. We'll talk about those two books. It's interesting because these books came out earlier this year before this terrible season that we've had of wildfires in the West. And then we cleverly knew that and then <laughs> put them off running them in the book review until this week's End Times issue. Um, now, we didn't actually know that, but I imagine that you probably saw the current fire season through new eyes after having read these books. Yeah, absolutely. And and both books kind of have the same thesis, which is that uh, we've completely mismanaged our wildlands in terms of fire prevention in that for the past hundred years or so, our main tactic has been to put out every fire as quickly as possible. What this does, unfortunately, is it builds up lots of brush and combustible elements in our forests. And so when we do have fires, they tend to be much more intense and destructive than in decades past. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that people don't really understand the necessity of fire, but could you explain a little bit about what the role is that fire plays in w woodland environments? Yeah, sure. It's actually, it's a natural cleanser. And you have to think that it's kind of um, the hubris of mankind to think that, you know, we can come in and change what's been going on for tens or hundreds of millions of years in these forests it, it's, it's really quite shocking. Of course, for all those tens and hundreds of millions of years before man mankind was around, um, fires were going on all the time. And they would rage across forests, and they would cleanse them of all the dead uh, vegetable matter inside. And so the forest would become stronger as a result, and you would have less devastating fires over time. All of a sudden, we come along, we roll into the West, the Western United States in particular, and we start putting out these fires immediately, and we don't let them uh, perform their natural cleansing function anymore. And that becomes very problematic over the decades. So obviously we do that in populated areas because people have built their nice homes there and they don't want their, you know, furniture and et cetera burning down, understandably. What about in national parks and in, in national forests? Do we prevent fires as a matter of policy from, from going on there or do we manage them differently from yeah, an area? Very much so. And it actually goes back to the early days of the Forest Service here in the U.S. Uh, in 1910, there was a devastating fire in Idaho. Came to be known as the big blow up. About 76 people died while fighting this fire. And this became part of the DNA of the Forest Service as it grew into what it is today. And so a big part of their mission statement as a result of the, the tragedy that occurred in Idaho was to let's fight fires everywhere we can. So our, our chief mission is going to be to try to put out every single fire by 10 a.m. the day after it's first recognized. And so there becomes a whole industry around this as well of people that spend the entire fire season, uh, often private contractors who go into national parks, who go into all sorts of wildlands and look for these fires and try to put them out as quickly as possible. But a lot of these people who work in parks are kind of, many of them, natural environmentalists, conservationists. I mean, is there a tension between the people who work in, in, in these parks and the policy, knowing that it not for the best? To some extent, but not necessarily, because I feel that it's so intuitive to think that fire is bad. And mm -hmm. so I think that for all of us who grew up with Smokey the Bear right. as the mascot of, of only you can prevent forest fires, it's, it's very intuitive to think, oh, fire is bad. And me as a wildlands professional working in a national park, it's good for me to put out these fires. And I think it's the scientists and people who work on the kind of view from 30,000 feet who've now realized that this is kind of a misguided policy. So looking at the current wildfire situation in California, and this I'm assuming is a result of years of this misguided policy? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, I think, and, and I'm assuming a, a, combined with the terrible drought they've had there. Yeah. So, so certainly climate plays a big role in this. And warming climate equals longer fire season and equals drier brush. So there, And of course, it creates a feedback loop as well. As you have a longer fire season, more destructive fires, the fires release all sorts of gases from the soil that then go into the atmosphere and intensify the greenhouse effect and create more warming. Yeah, in California, I think that you obviously have um, an exploding population. You have people moving into what CODIS calls in his book Megafire, wildland urban interface areas. These are people, as you noted before, who have perhaps plunged their life savings in building their dream homes on these frontier areas near forests that are combustible. They don't want fires to be let to rage because... It might destroy everything they have. They also don't want the Forest Service to go on and set preventive fires as well. Um, this is a big source of controversy in the West, where many times the Forest Service will say, look, we'll set a controlled fire in an area. This will thin out the vegetation and make it less likely we'll have a really tragic uh, catastrophe in the future. People don't want that to happen. They fear that it'll get out of control. It'll called slop over the fire, mm-hmm. and it'll become an inferno that cannot be tamed. So this book, Mega Fire, the Michael Cotis book, The Race to Extinguish a Deadly Epidemic of Flame. I mean, what does he mean by an epidemic? Just the, in the increasing intensity and frequency of these fires is something he notes throughout the book. Cotis does a really good job of giving us the kind of firefighter's eye view of what it's like to be on the front lines of combating that epidemic on a daily basis. He really evokes this kind of Sisyphean atmosphere that surrounds these firefighters and that they they dedicate everything to traveling around these really difficult areas, risking their lives. He talks about a lot of the devastation and uh, the deaths that occur in fighting fires. And yet every season gets worse and worse because of this misguided policy that governs how we control these forest areas. And so what does CODA see as the solution to this situation? Or is that not really the goal of his book? I would say he's somewhat optimistic. He believes that Due to the recent devastation, especially the deaths, he talks a lot about the fire that took place in Arizona, the Yarnell fire that killed 19 firefighters several years ago. And he thought maybe that would be a turning point, seeing how bad these things have gotten, seeing the human toll, that there will be discussions at the highest levels of government and administration to talk about changing the longstanding policy of of what I call the 10 a.m. rule, squelching every fire by 10 a.m., Let's turn to the other book by Edward Struzik, Firestorm, How Wildfire Will Shape Our Future. What's this book about? So they have a similar thesis when it talks about the misguided nature of uh, wildland policy. But Struzik's book is much more science-focused. I think it's written for an audience particularly that may have some prior experience with wildland science and fire science. It's also got kind of a Canadian bent as well. He focuses particularly on the Fort McMurray fire from several years back and talks a lot uh, about experiments and events that are taking place in, say, Alberta. And is the way that Canada manages their fire different from the American policy? No, it's not. They both really have the same gripe, which is that we just have wildly mismanaged these wildlands in service to homeowners and property owners, not really thinking about the, the, the larger picture. And so what did reading these two books, how did that inform the way you looked at the headlines this fall with the with what's going on in California. It was actually a little bit dispiriting because I feel like a lot of the conversation around those fires in the aftermath was we need to get better at fighting fires. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the case. In fact, both these books make a very good argument. We're astonishingly good at fighting fires. The problem is that if that's our only focus, we're guaranteeing more destructive fires in the future. Right. So I I feel that to see the the national conversation talking about technology of fighting fires and different ways to attack these infernos is kind of the wrong conversation to be having. But how do you address that? I mean, obviously, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. I mean, now that you have all of this development in areas that were, you know, are naturally forested or woody and are suffering probably because of climate change, terrible droughts. I mean, what do you say to those people in those homes sort of about how what the plan is moving forward when a fire breaks out in the hills of California? It's very difficult. And this is something that came up time and again, especially in Megafire, is that uh, when you do go to homeowners and property owners in these areas, they really don't want to hear not just that we have to let fires burn. They don't want to hear from the government at all. There's Mm -hmm. kind of this libertarian ethos among people in these areas a lot of times. They see themselves as these adventurous mountain people 
that don't need the government at mm-hmm. all. And so if the government except even, to put out the fires, <laughs> well, that's that. Yeah, that's the paradox, right? So they don't want to hear from the government until there actually is a fire. Then they complain about the the firefighting not being quick enough for their taste. So I think the skepticism of government intervention is a real big hurdle to overcome. You're an experienced science writer. You cover technology as well, not necessarily writing about fire. What surprised you about the science of fires that in reading these two books? Uh, I think the biggest thing was talking about the feedback loop, which I'm not aware of, about how uh, fires feed climate change, which I found very disturbing. The fact that as we have more intense and destructive fires covering more acreage, we're getting more greenhouse gases emitted, but not only greenhouse gases, also toxins. Mm -hmm. Things like when fires sweep through, and Struzik is very good at talking about this, old uranium mines, old, old arsenic mines that are in the Canadian wilderness, places that have been abandoned for many decades, fires sweep through, they release some really horrific toxins, which then carry for hundreds of miles in the atmosphere and can end up affecting people in large cities. So one thing he talks about is the fact that, well, maybe people in Toronto or Montreal don't care about these things going on in the prairies of Canada, but they should because that uranium and arsenic being churned up by these fires is going to affect them. Let's talk a little bit about the after effect of fires. And I'm assuming in nature, what happens when a fire burns down is that it goes through a natural process, right? And eventually new forest land will grow in its place. But what do, what happens now when after a fire? Do people brush and develop on that land? Is there some kind of policy about how what you're supposed to do with land after a fire? Yeah, so this is a big question, actually, is that what can we do to kind of goose or speed up the recovery, the natural recovery process. Certainly, there's a danger, of course, of people saying, well, this land is is beyond salvation. Maybe we should just turn this into private development. And of course, that keeps the cycle going of, of homes abutting really dangerous combustible areas. You know, the problem is that the recovery process takes place at a pace that I feel that we as human beings who have limited lifespans are not happy with. Mm -hmm. Millions of years ago, if a forest took several centuries to recover to its full glory, that was fine. For human beings who only live 70, 80, 90 years, that seems extraordinarily slow. So a lot of this comes down to short-term thinking and impatience, it sounds like. Yeah, the the, the core human foibles, I'd say. All right. Well, I guess a fitting way to end the year. Brendan, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Brendan Kerner reviewed two books in this week's End Times issue. The first is Firestorm, How Wildfire Will Shape Our Future by Edward Struzik. And Megafire, The Race to Extinguish a Deadly Epidemic of Flame by Michael Kodas. Henry Fountain joins us now. He is a reporter on the science desk here at The Times where he covers climate. And his new book is called The Great Quake, How the Biggest Earthquake in North America Changed Our Understanding of the Planet. Henry, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And for longtime New York Times podcast listeners, you are also of a former Times podcast here. Right, for the uh, the Science Times podcast for many years. So this is a, a Times podcaster on Times podcaster podcast segment. So how did you get interested in the subject of this particular earthquake, which was in 1964? Right, in 1964. Well, I've always, you know, I've always been interested in science, obviously, in earthquakes. And around the time of the 50th anniversary of this quake in 2014, I wrote a story about it in mm-hmm. the Times because it it played a very important role in the development of the theory of plate tectonics. Actually, so there's a, in addition to being the largest earthquake ever in North America, it has a sort of a role in the history of science. It's also a quake that people, particularly on the East Coast, nobody really knows about it. Although it was huge, it was in Alaska, so not a lot of people died. So it kind of fell out of the headlines very quickly. But it was a. Uh, it was a pretty phenomenal earthquake. I want to get back to that anniversary because I'm curious about what one does to commemorate, or I'm assuming we don't celebrate the anniversary of right. an earthquake or to observe it. But let's start with the quake itself. So this happened on March 27th, 1964. Good Friday. Where exactly? What happened? How big was it? So it, it was centered uh, about 80 miles from Anchorage, Alaska. At the time, it was measured as an 8.4 earthquake, which is huge. In retrospect, it's been determined to be more like 9.2, which is the the second largest ever recorded. After? After Chile in 1960. As I said, you know, Alaska maybe had 200,000 people at the time. So 
There was, I think, 130 fatalities. Actually, 12 of them were, or 15 of them were in California due to tidal waves or tsunamis. But among other things, the ground shook for something like four and a half minutes, which is, you know, an, an amazing amount of time. I set a timer for four and a half minutes so people get an idea of how long the ground was actually shaking. And then presumably there were aftershocks. There were aftershocks for months and months and months. There weren't any fatalities from the aftershocks, but, you know, the quake destroyed buildings in Anchorage. It created these local tsunamis that wiped out whole villages. The city of Valdez, the entire waterfront slumped into the harbor. It took 25 people with it who were there unloading a ship. So, you know, things happened that nobody had ever seen before, nobody would ever see again. A lot of people thought, this being the Cold War, a lot of people thought that the Russians had dropped an atomic bomb. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned that Alaska had a population of only 200,000 people at the time. I think not only are a lot of people on the East Coast unaware of this earthquake, but I don't think we have a good sense of what Alaska was like in 1964. Yeah, it was an interesting place. It had been a state for five years. It was starting to develop, uh, like the lower 48 had sort of discovered it, so it was becoming sort of a tourist destination. And in fact, Anchorage, which was by far the biggest place, was becoming kind of this Midwestern city, kind of sprawling Midwestern city sort of plopped down Mm -hmm. in the tundra. So it had a lot of aspirations to be more than just, you know, the home of like crazy gold miners and mountain men and and polar bears and and grizzly bears. It was really becoming sort of a middle class place. That said, the places that the quake hit the most in Prince William Sound were much more or much less developed, including a, a native village where life had basically been unchanged for a century. And it, what was the population there in terms of native versus? I think the total native population in Alaska at the time was about 40,000. How were they affected versus the, I guess at that time, almost immigrant population? Right. Well, in particular, this one village, which I write about a lot in the quake, uh, the village of Chiniga, which mm-hmm. was an uh, Aleut village of about 75 people, it was hit by a, um, a tsunami you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a little village in a cove on a little island in Prince William Sound, had no electricity, no running water. It was hit by a tsunami that was generated by uh, sediments that slumped not very far away, like glacial sediments, underwater glacial sediments. So the actual tsunami hit the village while the ground was still shaking, three minutes into the earthquake. So nobody had a chance to do anything. Everybody kind of tried to run to the top of a hill where the schoolhouse was. 25 people didn't make it. And for those people in particular, their village was destroyed. The survivors, they had a tough time. It took them really 20 years to reestablish a village. Were earthquakes common in Alaska? Is this- yeah. Earthquakes, uh, I think something like 16% of the world's earthquakes happen in Alaska. It's a, it's a major subduction zone where, you mm-hmm. know, one plate is sliding underneath another. And uh, most of them are not as huge as this, but they have earthquakes all the time there. And is it is it the same fault line that runs through California, or is it? It's it is uh, it gets complicated, but a better way to perhaps think of it, it's the same situation that occurs all around the Pacific Rim. It's what causes the earthquakes in Japan, the one that uh, led to the Fukushima disaster, the earthquake in two thousand four that led to the Indian Ocean tsunamis. It's basically one huge subduction zone. The margins of the Pacific are an area where. The Pacific Plate, which is an oceanic plate, is spreading out and sliding under the continental margins. And that causes friction. And eventually, friction is overcome. The rocks break and you have a huge earthquake. Okay, I want to get back to the science in just a second, but a little bit more about the human impact. We didn't, I don't think, have FEMA at that time. No, we didn't have FEMA. The federal government did a great job, though. You know, Alaska was a new state. It had gotten a lot of attention in Washington because of statehood. It had a very powerful congressman. The federal government came in with, I think, within six months with $300 million of aid, which is, you know, in 1964, was a lot of money. And they also sent in, uh, you know, scientists and research teams and everything to sort of improve earthquake resilience in the future. So, so it really got a lot of attention from the feds. Did that federal support end up sort of helping create more infrastructure in Alaska? Um, It did, but Alaska had so much federal money for infrastructure. All of the defense spending in the Cold War, I mean, a huge portion of it went to Alaska. That was the first line of defense against the Soviet attack. You know, things like the Dew Line, the big radar system to detect when an ICBM was coming in from the Soviet Union. So Alaska had lots and lots of federal money. 
You mentioned earlier that this quake played a role in forwarding our understanding of plate tectonics. What yeah. what was the science up to that point, and what did this quake teach us? Well, it's interesting. So, I mean, I didn't really realize this, but in the mid '60s, you know, plate tectonics was not a done deal by any means. It was still a big subject of debate, and between really prominent scientists on both sides. What, so, was, the, what was the other view? Well, there was a lot of different views. One, an early view. I mean, this all goes back to Alfred Wegener and the theory of continental drift in 1910, 1920. One theory was that the Earth was born hot and it was cooling and contracting, and that contraction created mountains and ocean basins, et cetera. Later, it was because it came to be ex pretty much accepted that new crust was being formed at these oceanic ridges where magma oozes out from deeper down, spreads out. So to try to understand that, a lot of people thought, well, the Earth must actually be expanding. Mm -hmm. When in fact, the Earth is not expanding, but as that crust oozes out and starts to spread from either side, it eventually runs into the continents. And as the earthquake showed, it slides underneath the continents and in a process called subduction. And then at some point, earthquakes happen. As I like to say, it's not that the work that was done to understand this earthquake, which was done primarily by one geologist, it's not like it it was the smoking gun that said, oh, plate tectonics is real, but it helped confirm the theory because by the 60s, there was a lot of evidence that this theory of subduction must be accurate. But this quake showed, yeah, this is actually an example of it and what happens when the stresses build up. So what exactly happened in this earthquake that made that clear? Well, this one geologist basically spent the summer of 1964, a fellow by the name of George Plafker, who was still alive. I spent a lot of time with him. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah, it was great. It was a, a wonderful experience. He went around Prince William Sound, which is where most of the damage occurred, and measured the deformation of the land. Some of the land rose up as much as 30 feet in this mm. earthquake. Some of it sunk down 8 or 10 feet. And he went around basically on a barge and measured coastline and how the coastline had changed in comparison to the tides and came up with a, a map of the deformation of the, of the land. It was a huge amount of land. I mean, basically an area the size of California deformed during this quake. And, you know, George Plafker was basically, he was like a, a field geologist. He was an Alaska geologist for the U.S. Geological Survey. But he spent a lot of time thinking about it. And he kind of put two and two together. And he realized the only way you could explain this deformation, the pattern of deformation, is if you accepted the idea that one plate was sliding underneath another at a very shallow angle, as opposed to, say, like the San Andreas Fault in mm -hmm. California, where you have the two sides of the, of the fault are essentially vertical. So in this case, George just, just figured out this has to be a shallow, what they call a thrust fault. And the only way to explain that is if you understand that, in fact, one plate is sliding under another. So the way I like to say it is the only way you can understand this earthquake is if you accept the idea of plate tectonics and subduction. So that's that's how it got figured out. Did the very particular climate of Alaska affect the way that this could be explored? Because the, the quake happened on March 27th. You said that he was there over the summer. Presumably, the land then freezes at some point. I don't know if that makes it more difficult, easier. Well, in fact, it was frozen when the quake happened. It was, springtime comes very late in Alaska. So... Uh, he and a couple other geologists were sent there. And the only reason they were sent there was because they were Alaska people. They knew how to get around. They weren't afraid of bears. They weren't afraid of being in the backwoods by themselves for a week or two. So they went up for a couple of weeks, did some preliminary research, discovered this incredible amount of deformation of the land and stuff, and made plans to come back in the summer when you actually you could get around and camp out for weeks and stuff. So, so actually, the, uh, it was the thawing of the land in the summer that made it possible to do all the work. So let's get back now to that anniversary in 2014. What, what does the anniversary of a terrible earthquake look like? Well, in, in, uh, in Anchorage and other places, they actually did commemorate it. But from my point of view, I, you know, we here at the Times, we don't, we don't generally do anniversary stories. And, and um, certainly in the science section, which I was writing for at the time, we tend to shy away from them. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to do it. And then, like, I think on April 1st of 2014, like three or four days after the anniversary, there was a pretty large quake in Chile. There was an 8.2 or something. Mm -hmm. Created some tsunamis that traveled across the ocean, et cetera. So I thought, you know, everybody instantly recognizes this kind of quake, this 8.2 Chilean quake, April 1st of 2014, as a megathrust subduction-related earthquake. 
But in 1964, nobody knew what that was. And it was because of this work by this geologist that we've all figured this out. So I thought, you know, this is a good example, a good opportunity to, you know, use this April 1st Chilean quake as an excuse to talk about what happened in 1964 and the work that was done by this one scientist. I view the book as sort of like celebrating the work of this guy. And what what would, what was his career after? He became kind of a, a, an earthquake expert. He still mm-hmm. worked for USGS doing mineral resource work, which is essentially what he did, you know, exploring Alaska to figure out the geology, to figure out if there was gold, nickel, petroleum, whatever. But he became, because this work was so important, he became kind of an, ex, uh, an expert on earthquakes. So when an earthquake would happen, particularly if it was off-season Alaska, if it was like wintertime when he couldn't be working in Alaska anyway, he went off and studied him. So he studied he studied the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake when he was, you know, already retired from the geological survey. So he really had a, a pretty amazing career. He's still at age, I think, 88 or 89. He still goes to the USGS office in Menlo Park every day. He's still working on the whole Alaska quake. Mm. I spent, at the end of the book, I talk about how I was with him in 2015 in the Copper River Delta in Alaska, where he'd taken some cores, and he's trying to determine the sequence of major earthquakes in Alaska. And he's pretty much figured out they happen every, like, five or 600 years. So he's still, he's still actively engaged in the field. Well, you haven't been engaged in the field for quite as long no. as, as, as him, but you have been reporting on climate, natural disaster, science for a long time. I would imagine that not that much surprises you, although correct me if I'm wrong, but what was the most surprising thing that you found working on this book? The most surprising thing was just fully understanding the power of the quake, I think. I mean, you know, I grew up in the East Coast. I have never experienced anything more than like a 4.0 earthquake. And from talking to people, seeing the evidence, I mean, George and I went to an island in Prince William Sound and stood on what had been a beach, a cobble beach, and within four minutes on March 27, 1964, it was raised 35 feet in the air. Wow. And it's been there ever since. There's now new land towards the sea. And there's, this being Alaska, things grow pretty fast, this, you know, particularly in Prince William Sound. So you're standing there and there's spruce trees, 50-foot tall spruce trees growing out mm. of the cobble. So, so I think for me that was the, the amazing thing was seeing direct evidence of the power of this quake. Well, I hesitate to call a book about an earthquake fun, but this is a kind of fun reading for a lot of people. The book, again, is The Great Quake, How the Biggest Earthquake in North America Changed Our Understanding of the Planet by the Times' own Henry Fountain. Henry, thanks for being here. Thanks so much. Alexandra Alter joins us now with some news from the literary world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. I think I'm going to talk about some fairly old news today. and I'm She's going look- to be here with some olds from the literary world. <laughs> yeah. I thought we could look back on, on the publishing industry in 2017 and how things stand for both authors and publishers because it's, as you know, a really tumultuous business that really hinges on huge blockbuster books to survive. And so things this year were a little steadier and a little more boring than they've been in previous years. There wasn't a Harry Potter book. There wasn't a Fifty Shades of Grey or a Gone Girl or even a book like All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, which became this sort of word of mouth bestseller. So there wasn't a huge breakout book or a book that sort of set the cultural conversation. But publishers did reasonably well. The industry looks pretty stable, if not exciting. Apparently, there were some slight increases still in print sales. They were up around 2% over 2016. That's according to NPD BookScan. And the number of independent bookstores held pretty steady. Barnes & Noble is still struggling, and they have a new strategy, according to one of their recent earnings calls with investors, which is to focus on selling books, which I thought was a brilliant strategy for a book Oh, my God, imagine that. (laughs) Please do. (laughs) Although I do have to say they do have some great toys and games at Barnes & Noble. Sure. And some other trends that we've been seeing month over month this year seem to have held up for the duration of the year. That includes the decline in ebook sales and the rise the surprising rise of hardcover sales according to the Association of American Publishers latest report hardcover sales were up almost 2% in January through August of this year and ebooks were down more than 5% and there's still massive growth in the downloaded audio space that seems to be still the strongest segment of the publishing industry so downloaded audio grew more than 30% in those months 
The other thing that I thought, you know, was interesting looking back on the year, and this really took off in January, was that spike in classic dystopian novels. There was a period where the bestseller list was dominated by Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, George Orwell's 1984, and even Sinclair Lewis's novel, It Can't Happen Here. It was interesting to see sort of readers turning to those books when politics seemed so sort of bleak and also tumultuous and angry. I think people were looking for models in an old dystopian fiction. And then there was, of course, you know, the the new dystopian fiction keeps coming. There are a bunch of great books out this year, including American War by Omar al-Khad and Lydia Yuknovich's The Book of Joan. And there's even more coming, I think, in 2018. So that's a trend that we will probably continue to see. Alexandra, this is a time of year where we often do like the most and the worst and the least and the best and the craziest. And I'm wondering if among the stories that you've worked on or sort of things you've noticed in the industry what was the the maybe the most exciting story to emerge? Well, one thing that I've been fascinated by this year and and in recent years is this development in children's publishing where authors are really tackling tough contemporary social issues. This year, we saw a bunch of books come out for young adults that address the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality against young African Americans in really sort of visceral ways, but also in very like beautiful literary ways. The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas was a debut novel that I wrote about that I thought started some really interesting conversations, and it was a big bestseller. These books are not just sort of issue-driven books. They have great characters and stories, and readers are really connecting with them. And similarly, Later on in the year, we saw a really moving novel from John Green, Turtles All the Way Down, which dealt with his anxiety and his obsessive compulsive disorder through a fictionalized context. He wrote about a teen girl who had those conditions, and I think people really connected with that as well. And there was also a a huge crop of books that dealt with the refugee crisis in in really sort of moving ways, including picture books. So you're, you're seeing authors addressing readers as young as four or five and saying, like, this is what's happening in the world and you need to be engaged with it. I think it's really easy to make fun of teenagers, and I enjoy doing that. But um, <laughs> but one of the great things about them is that among all of their passions and trends and fandom and, and things that they get obsessed about that we one might not like are books. And they are so enthusiastic about what they read. And you really see these, like, massive trends in YA going on and online cultures, whether it's on Snapchat or Instagram or Pinterest or any other form of social media where teenagers really connect over these stories, especially when they give voice to things that they're experiencing in their own lives. Absolutely. And I think that in past years, a lot of the YA books that were at the top of the bestseller list were these fantasies. You had the Twilight period and the Hunger Games period and, of course, Harry Potter for a long, long time. And the ones that seem to be really resonating now are not at all escapist. They're very much rooted in the real world and, and, and you know, real world problems. All right. Well, to escape the real world for just a second, yes. I want to end with you are a reporter on the news, not a predictor of the news or a conjurer of the news. But any thoughts on what we might see happen in 2018 or what you would like to see happen in 2018? One really exciting space in the publishing world right now are are these small presses like Grey Wolf Press, Coffee House, New Direction, Archipelago, and other smaller publishers that are actually producing all these prize-winning authors that are becoming bestsellers. And it's so surprising because often they've been viewed as this sort of tiny corner of the industry. They're not competing with the big houses to land the big authors. They can't shell out massive advances. And yet we've seen some of the most exciting authors in years coming through these presses. So I'm hoping to see some more of that, and I'll be keeping a close eye on what they'll be publishing. Okay, lots to look forward to and talk about in 2018. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks, Pamela. This is John Williams, and I'm joined this week by my colleagues Greg Coles, Gal Beckerman, and Lovia Gyarki to talk about what we're reading. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi. Hello. Greg, to my left, let's start with you. Well, I'm uh, going into the new year with some poetry, and this is one of those kind of internet rabbit holes. The blogger Maria Popova, the blogger and writer um, who has this great blog called Brain Pickings, where she kind of tells you what she's reading. It does something a lot like this, only maybe better. (laughs) Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) (laughs) She recently resurfaced on Twitter a piece that she'd written back in September 
about the poet Jane Kenyon and specifically about Amanda Palmer reading this Jane Pe- Kenyon mm-hmm. poem about depression, living with melancholy. I, I, I can't remember the exact title, but it it promptly sent me back to Jane Kenyon, who died 22 years ago now when she was still in her 40s. She died of cancer. And before th- that time, she was really building a real career, a, a very substantial reputation that I, I feel like she, she's maybe not gotten her due since then. Had she lived, she'd still be active today. Mm-hmm. And she was married to the poet Donald Hall. They lived in New Hampshire. She wrote a very kind of flinty, New Englandy, you know, in, in the tradition of Robert Frost or Mary Oliver, kind of uh, New England landscape people. Not, not that she wrote landscape poems only or necessarily, but there is a, a very kind of observational, almost devotional quality to her poetry. You're going to read something? I, I, sh- I will. I'll read something short. I won't read the melancholy poem because it's actually a poem sequence in in nine separate poems, and, and so it would take up too much time here. Uh, I'm but seeing I, a special book podcast just yeah. for the poem. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 um, but um, what I'm going to read from is the, the last poem, the poem she was working on when she died. It's collected as the very last poem in selected poems that came out posthumously called Otherwise. Donald uh, Hall wrote an afterward to this book and and then closed it out with this poem that she had still been revising up to the moment of her death, and he put it into what he thought was kind of its final shape and, and closed the book out with that as a farewell. It's called The Sick Wife. The sick wife stayed in the car while he bought a few groceries. Not yet fifty, she had learned what it's like not to be able to button a button. It was the middle of the day, and so only mothers with small children or retired couples stepped through the muddy parking lot. Dry cleaning swung and gleamed on hangers in the cars of the prosperous. How easily they moved, with such freedom, even the old and relatively infirm. The windows began to steam up. The cars on either side of her pulled away so briskly that it made her sick at heart. And that's how it ends. So she, she does this thing very in keeping with maybe somebody like Mary Oliver where she pays close attention to the surface of things and it kind of implies a greater depth than that underneath. But she, kind of she's not... a cumulative effect to her noticing. It, exactly. That's nice. Exactly. A real kind of crystal clarity to it. Thanks for so, reading those. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> it's real cheery for the New Year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a... <laughs> Well, your title here I'm, is Okay, so I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah speaking of cheery. Yeah, speaking of cheery. Well, I'm, I'm less looking forward than still trying to make sense of what we just lived through over the mm. last uh, <laughs> year <laughs> or so. I, I have a nonfiction book that came out this year called Kill All Normies, Online Culture War. I'll read the subhead because it's it'll give you more information. Uh, <laughs> Kill All Normies, Online Culture Wars from 4chan and Tumblr to Trump and the alt-right. And it's by Angela Nagel, who is a writer based in Ireland. And from I hadn't heard much about her before this book, but from what I can tell, she writes a lot for a number of newspapers there. And this book is... It's 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 like a it's a slim book, but it's super fascinating because she just like delves headfirst into this like subterranean. I don't know what other kind of underground you know adjectives we. She puts, <laughs> like, she puts on her hazmat suit. She puts on her hazmat suit <laughs> and does a really deep dive into uh, with with a with a very kind of attuned kind of critic kind of analytical um, eye at this world of kind of online chat rooms and she's looking mostly at places like. 4chan and Reddit and and Tumblr and trying to kind of identify where the the, the current iteration of the culture wars like began to bubble up in in those forums, and it's quite interesting because it's also kind of an intellectual history of what she calls this kind of ironic transgressive style that a lot of these what we think of like as trolls mm-hmm. or, or people that hang out in these places mm-hmm. have kind of manifested and then kind of became in some ways the style of the president. And she sees it as actually kind of an apotheosis of like a 60s counterculture, like Hi. counter mainstream worldview that has kind of become the rights, the extreme it's the rights. the right wing version of wavy gravy. Exactly. And like the and like the yippies and like, you know, that that whole kind of like, you know, we're just going to like put it to the man. But, you know, that it's kind of over time shifted to 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 something that this extreme right that has kind of found its place online has kind of taken up. And also as a reaction to she also looks at kind of the left 
the kind of extreme left as it found its place on Tumblr. I guess that's, I didn't realize that, but that apparently was like the platform of choice and kind of this kind of moral self-righteousness, kind of exclusive, kind of victim blame, you know, this. It's fairly well represented on Twitter too. Right. It's represented (laughs) on Twitter too. And she sees the right as kind of a reaction to that. But all of this, all of this culture war is like playing out in in this online realm and then taking on these kind of political matters manifestations in in the real world. And it's just fascinating to kind of understand also the disconnect between kind of the extreme right that's represented by this kind of transgressive style and how different it is from like the conservative right that we've kind of come to know. But, yeah. but she really gets like, you know, deep into this stuff. And it's it's actually a kind of a dense book in a way. Um, it's very small, though. It's very yeah. small and dense. Lovia, you have something small also. Is it dense and depressing? Um, yes, it is, actually. So I'm Yay. on trend. I also want to say to this point, as like a self-proclaimed Tumblr junkie, I, I find this very fascinating. Yeah. I've always thought of it as like more of an aesthetic platform that's mm. punctuated by, you know, that sort of like moral righteousness that one finds more on Twitter. So yeah. am, I, am I asked to borrow that? Yeah, definitely. After you're definitely. done. I, continuing and entering the new year with sad and depressing things, I'm reading a book called Beyond the Horizon by Ama Darko. And it's also a continuation of my personal quest to read more Ghanaian female writers and to sort of like understand that literary landscape a little bit more. This book is about a village girl named Mara who has an arranged marriage to a guy who is at best abusive. And that's like, (laughs) that really sort of colors the entire book. And they move from, it's sort of in three acts. So they move from their Amadarko begins with her with their marriage in the village and it's abusive, etc. And then they move to the city in Ghana and still continues to be abusive. And Mara is just like this really naive character who's super frustrating at times. And the sort of the crux of the the novel is that they both eventually move to Germany. And so it's more of this like immigration tale as well as this black feminism sort of story. And like I said before, like Mara is a really frustrating character, and I find it really fascinating because The way that it's, so it's Amadarko's first novel and was published in 1995. And she's written a couple novels after that. Faceless, I think, is her most, like, famous one. I mean, it has, like, the elements of an early novel, you know, like, sort of, like, mixed styles, um, super raw. But one thing that I really like about it and sort of makes the book hard to stomach is how intense the scenes are between Mara and her husband. Sort of, like, her depictions of abuse are just, like, really troublesome, but I think really speak to the main character's growth throughout the novel from this like very naive village girl to an intelligent but sort of misguided German Ghanaian woman. I was going to ask about the growth, not that there has to be any. Yeah. I, I'm not one of those readers, but, I, uh, <laughs> but I'm curious because you said she's frustrating. I mean, is there, yeah. she grows, but she stays with him? She does. I'm not It's like, I want to ask if she <laughs> leaves him at the right. end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every chapter, I'm hoping that she sort of, you know, like understands and packs her bags and leaves. And it's really interesting because there are a lot of interesting sort of peripheral female characters. So I find it really fascinating. Not to make light of it, but I, I'm definitely reading a book about an abusive relationship <laughs> in, a, in a different way. Silently abusive for a long time and then, and then explosively so. Which is, and, and you know, podcast <laughs> listeners will have to uh, forgive me for bringing us back to Emmanuel Carrere, but... Um, You're putting a capstone on 20. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more fitting to, to wrap up the year with. And, but I'm reading his book, The Adversary, which I think Jen Salai talked about earlier in the year, but we, we, we talked about a couple of his other books at greater length. This is a true crime book about a man who lived a lie for about two decades where he claimed to have gone to medical school and he claimed to be working for the WHO in Geneva. And it turned out his whole life was a lie. He had been stealing money from friends and family and, and, and he decides to sort of reckon with this lie by killing his entire family, his parents, his wife, his children, and then he survived. He was supposed to die also. Carrere, which I didn't realize even in talking to people here who had read it, is in touch with this man after he recovers and they communicate a bit. And so he learns a lot more about the story. This is obviously not a story with redemption in it, but it's also just completely and compulsively readable. I mean, I read the first 120 pages in, you know, one sitting and, and there's only, it's only about a 200 page. There are aspects where Carrer is sympathetic right. to him as, really, as, as, you know, to, to, to his deceptions. Yeah, um, yeah I mean. Uh, and, and to the trap that he sets for himself. 
Yes, and if and in Carrere's other books, he he's interested definitely in human motivation, even when it's dark. He's interested in Christian forgiveness, even when it seems impossible. So there are all these very you know complicated things. I mean, obviously, as as an average reader, I <laughs> it, it's impossible to bridge that gap between the way he decided because you know I'm at a point in the book I'm nearly done where he's talking about how he always assumed that this would end with his suicide because how else could it end? You know, once everyone figures all this out, but to sort of instead of doing that, to sort of you know, instead of just taking responsibility for what you've done and killing all these other family, people, there's right, no, right. you know, other than deep psychopathology or just depravity, there's no really way around it or to rationalize it. But if you're interested in human psychology and, and I'm more interested in just Carrera's writing because I think he's great. And so I, I just wanted to read something very brief from near the beginning, which is where this friend of the murderer, whose name is Jean-Claude Raymond, is you know, remembering how he felt after Jean-Claude was taken from this fire and was sort of struggling to hang on to life. And and the friend at this point thought that it was just a, a blown boiler or something and that his his friend and his family had died, but that it wasn't his, his doing. His career writes, he was suffering from burns, smoke inhalation, and the barbiturates he had taken, the doctor said, but they expected him to regain full consciousness over the weekend and to be well enough by Monday to be interrogated. Right after the fire, when everyone still thought it had been an accident, Luke and Cecile had prayed for him to die. That had been for his sake. Now they prayed for him to die, but it was for themselves, for their children, for all those who were still alive. That he himself should remain, death made man, in the world of the living, was a frightful threat hanging over them. The assurance that peace would never be restored, that the horror would never end. Oh boy. So Happy, New you, yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Inside the New York Times Book Review is produced by Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media. Thanks for listening. For the New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.